staying with this particular story, giving you some analysis now. Ntabi Seng Tubazana is a legal expert from Tubazana Attorneys. Ntabi Seng, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I mean, looking at the seriousness of these charges, how difficult or easy of a task does the state have in proving its case? Well, at this stage, we don't know much if they have a difficult task or an easy task because bail application is usually based on just a prima facie case, whether or not at this particular stage the state has sufficient evidence to prosecute. And clearly from what we've seen, they have sufficient evidence. So later on, when the matter is now ready for trial, when a disclosure is ready to happen, then maybe we may have an inkling of how it is that the state intends on proceeding with this matter. But unfortunately, because we are not um, the defense attorneys, we will not know exactly what it is that they have. We will have an indication, hopefully, from the defense attorneys what they have in their docket um, that is that has been given to them by the state. But at this stage, the state seems to be very confident that they have a very strong case. And it's interesting because you talk about, you know, the fact that very little right now is known about, you know, how strong this case is, what kind of evidence there is. But the defense not relenting in saying that for them, the state case appears to be weak and they're saying that the state is relying on a Section 204 witness. So it's interesting that they bring all of this up in a bail application and also when they were trying to make their case for urgency. Yes, indeed. Um, when, with bail applications, um, like I said, it's a prima facie case. Mm. So we are going to be basically grabbing at straws, for lack of a better term, as defense attorneys, because all we're relying on is the I.O. statement. Sometimes the court may allow maybe the A1, which is the complainant statement, to be handed in as evidence, or maybe one or two others, but we don't get that much information from the state at bail proceedings. So when we are grabbing at straws, so to speak, as, as defense attorneys, we always throw in that based on the evidence that is placed before this court at this particular moment, we can say that the state doesn't have sufficient evidence or a strong enough case against me, and therefore the court must consider it when looking at exceptional circumstances that may lead to me being released out on bail. I could be wrong, but with the amounts that were involved in this, this ought to have been a Schedule 6 bail application. Uh, at, at minimum, it ought to have been a Schedule 5 bail application, which means her affidavit would read out exceptional circumstances, which include um, uh, the state's case being weak amongst them. Mm, and in fact, it was a schedule five. But uh, le let's then look at, you know, the the arguments uh, the, by the defense that the state is relying on a section 204 witness and therefore it does it for them. That also signals the fact that they're just relying on the one witness, the state saying, but actually we do have, you know, corroborated evidence in that particular regard but have we seen in the past especially because you would know you in the courts if you know some of these cases are won by possibly one section 204 witness it does happen quite often and a section 204 witness is a person who was initially an accused person and then they decide to turn state's evidence and now they are now on the side of the state and usually they negotiate for themselves a lighter sentence or a non-sentence at all in exchange for the information they're going to give the state so a section 204 witness was initially an accused person and that usually turns the case on its head especially if the state did not have the kind of information this section 204 person would have uh, and therefore with that it makes the case even stronger so a lot of times a case is actually won by the witness in terms of section 204 of the criminal procedure act but using that in bail application doesn't make sense because for bail we're just trying to find whether or not it is in the best interest of, of the community that the accused person be released out on bail. And the onus is on the applicant, which is the accused, to show the court that it's in the best interest of justice that they are released out on bail and show cause as to how, if they are released out on bail, they would abide by any bail conditions that were set forth. And based on the 
prima facie case that the state has at this particular moment, there is no reason for the court to say, listen, you don't qualify for bail um, based on X, Y, and Z. So the two or four witnesses at this stage were a little bit premature. They should have waited a little bit to play that card. Should they have also played the card about what they think about the charges, especially when they say the charges are being hasty? It, looked, it looks like, you know, things needed to be done before the election. I don't know how they're basing anything on that particular statement because um, in order for them to know that they would have access they would have to have access to the docket which they don't want so how do they know that the state is not ready how do they know that the state is rushing things how do they know anything when they don't have access to anything at the end of the day they only have access to what the state will permit at this current juncture, which is usually only the IO's um, affidavit in terms of this bail application. So I, I think that there might have been a misunderstanding on what it is that can be used in an application for bail, uh, because the things that have been used so far for me, I would not have even bothered touching. I would focus on the issue at hand, whether or not my client is a suitable candidate to be released out or on bail, because it is really irrelevant. Um, whether or not the state is ready. At the end of the day, NPA or the state in this situation is Dominus Litis. They are the ones who decide how the matter is going to be heard. So how do you then determine that they are not ready when they are the ones who are supposed to control how the matter is going to be heard? And how strong of an argument is, uh, you know, what her lawyers have been saying even now as well, and they said it when they were making the case for urgency, that she's likely to suffer irreparable harm because she continues to maintain her innocence and giving her standing in society should it be found that she's actually not guilty she would have suffered irreparable harm no it's too early for that we need to wait until the matter has been concluded to see whether or not there is any harm that's going to be suffered from the accused side at this stage i think from the urgent application what they were trying to do was to preempt and also stop an arrest which doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. what reason do you have that the arrest is going to be unlawful in the first place the the requirements for an unlawful arrest are only founded after the action itself has happened so the way in which the the attorneys in this matter went around it didn't make any sense or any logic for that matter in law how it is that they chose to approach this matter the way that they did it is of no consequence that is going to suffer irreparable harm. At this stage, there is sufficient evidence for the state to proceed. If six months down the line, um, the, the matter is withdrawn for whatever reason due to lack of evidence, then at that stage, we can show the irreparable harm that has happened to the accused. But right now, what is it that has, she has suffered? Because she, ha she hadn't even been uh, formally charged up until today. So there was no reason for her to say that she's going to suffer any sort of harm going forward. Quite interesting, um, especially when you think about, you know, what needs to form part of a bail application, what needs to form part of an urgent application, and what we've seen um, unfold in court today. But thank you so much for your analysis, and I'm saying do appreciate it. That was Ntabi Saying Dubasana, the legal expert from Dubasana Attorneys.